Hello, all of my history-loving friends. This is Madame Morbid. I am your guide on any number of historical adventures. And we are in Platte City. It's really near the Kansas City International Airport. This is the site of one of the Barrow Gang's most famous shootouts. They were almost caught here. This area is pretty much completely unrecognizable. To figure out exactly where the buildings once stood, I took a modern Google map and lined it up with a 1964 aerial image of the area when the tavern still stood. It looks like the former site of all of these buildings is underneath this body of water. Before they arrived here, the gang had been having a very bad six weeks or so. On June 10th, Bonnie was in that horrible car wreck in Wellington, Texas. That wreck was caused completely by Clyde driving recklessly. He was going about 70 miles an hour. He failed to see a detour sign. And the next thing they knew, they were driving through a wooden barricade to close the road and the car flipped several times and she was injured very, very badly by battery acid from that car. Over the next few weeks, they are fleeing with a very injured woman. She got hooked on pain meds. Initially, they holed up in Fort Smith, Arkansas in a tourist cabin there. Her sister, Billie Jean, came and was helping nurse her. Basically, Clyde wouldn't leave her side, so all of the the jobs were being done by WD and Buck because Clyde wanted to be there for Bonnie at first because of her delicate condition and next when he was trying to get her off of the pain meds she had got hooked on because he didn't want to leave Billy, her sister, alone with her because he thought she would give in and give her the pain meds. Billy wasn't with them by the time they got here in Platte City. Unfortunately, in a small Arkansas town outside of Fort Smith called Alma, Buck and W.D. bungled a robbery. They ended up killing the town marshal. His name was Humphrey and had to flee, even though Bonnie was in really bad shape. From Alma, they're driving, and as they're driving, Buck and Clyde are fighting. Clyde continues to say, we have got to stay somewhere for several days to help Bonnie get better. And Buck agreed with that, but he did not agree that they should stop in Kansas City. First of all, the Kansas City Massacre had just happened. Everyone was going to be on the lookout. And this happens time and time again. Other people have a better idea than Clyde, but he is so stubborn, he will not listen to anybody. He does not listen to Buck. As they're going through Kansas City, they stop at a filling station to get gas. It was called Slim's Castle. People around there knew of this intersection as the Junction. Right across the street from Slim's Castle was the Red Crown Tavern and the cabins. And Clyde made the decision to stop here. That was a really bad decision for several reasons. Number one, the Red Crown is where police met all the time to exchange information. Number two, those two cabins were it. There were no other guests to blend in with. One of the things that initially drew attention was how Blanche was dressed. She was wearing those tight little riding breeches that people around Platte City did not wear. And 40 years later, people were still talking about her pants. It drew that much attention. Also, a lot of the money they had was in loose change because just before getting here so that they could have enough money to be in one spot for several days, they had just done a series of robberies. And a lot of it was they would break into gumball machines and take all of the change out of them. So they had a ton of loose change that she kept paying for everything with. The attendant working at Slim's directed them over to the tavern so that they could rent these cabins. Clyde was drawn to them, he said, partially because they were made of brick, which made him feel safe. This is something he told his family later on. Blanche basically becomes their gopher at this point. It's something she complained about, but it wasn't untrue. She was made to do all of this stuff for them. Before Blanche went in to rent the room, WD and Buck got in the back seat and they covered them with blankets because she rented the room for three people. Since Buck and WD had done the murder in Alma, 
I'm assuming that's why they chose them to be the ones that they hid. The Red Crown manager was suspicious from the start. Number one, because of how she was dressed. He couldn't believe it when she pulled out coins to pay him. And we aren't talking $4 and quarters. These machines take pennies and nickels. She's paying $4 in pennies and nickels. Think about how awkward that would be to be standing there counting out 400 pennies while the manager stares at you and watches. And you're already scared to death anyway because you're on the run. And she paid for their meals in this small change also. After she got back in the car and they pulled away, he watched through the window. And he saw them back the car in the garage, gangster style, and close it up tight. That was how gangsters did it, so that you could make a quick getaway if need be. Blanche came back. Her and Buck took the left-hand cabin. Clyde, WD, and Bonnie were in the right-hand cabin. They were able to get to the car through a door in the cabin itself. Buck and Blanche had to go out the front door to get to the car, and that is going to be very important later when they are raided. Clyde told Blanche to go get them five meals at the restaurant. She said, but I told them there's only three of us. And he said, I don't care. We all need a meal. So get five meals. She did as she was told. The manager watched as she came into the cafe. He paid attention to her order and saw that she ordered five meals and five beers for what she said was a party of three. And again, she paid all in change. One thing I've wondered about is the logistics of one woman carrying five meals and five beers. Did an employee help her? Did she have to make multiple trips to carry all that back? That's gonna look weird. Why won't anyone else come out of that cabin and help her? After this, he follows her over and says he needs the license plate for the car. Blanche didn't really know what to do. She's kind of blindsided by this. So there wasn't much she could do except bring him over. Clyde opened the door. He wrote down the license plate, but they would not allow him past the garage into the room itself, which she finds suspicious. Unfortunately, Clyde had put a license plate on there of a car he had stolen earlier. So when this license plate gets run, they find out this car was stolen back on June 26th from a doctor's house in Oklahoma. Now that's not the car they were in. That car had been abandoned a long time ago, but Clyde reused the license plate. But Clyde said, it's okay. It's probably gonna take him a while to run it. We won't worry about it. Then overnight, Clyde covered all of the windows with newspapers. Again, that looked super suspicious. They slept that night and they slept late the next day. It's July 18th and they sleep late into the 19th the next morning. And unfortunately for the Barrow Gang, the Red Crown Tavern was where all the cops would get together. They don't have radios at this time. So cops would get together and exchange information at the Red Crown Tavern because the food was really good. With these suspicions, all the manager had to do was walk over to the restaurant when he knew the police would be there and have a conversation with them. He ended up talking to William Baxter, a captain in the Missouri Highway Patrol, told him his suspicions. He gave him the license plate number. And he goes and he runs it and figures out it's a stole from a stolen car. At the same time, the Sh Platte County Sheriff, Holt Coffee has also been notified about people behaving really strangely over at the Red Crown. So he and Baxter get together and they start surveilling the cabins. Everybody in town seems to know something's going on because all of a sudden there's police everywhere, there's highway patrol, and they can tell they're watching this cabin. It's like everyone in town knows something's up except the members of the Barrow Gang. Covering this window up does, yeah, no, nobody can see in the window, but Clyde can't see out either to see what's going on outside. Holt Coffee comes to the Kansas City authorities and he tells them, I need machine guns, I need shields to protect my officers, I need an armored car. And at first, the Kansas City law enforcement is like, 
I am so sick and tired of every tiny little town and coming to me and telling me they need all of our stuff. It's just ridiculous. And Coffee replied, yeah, but I think I might very possibly have the barrel gang on my hands. That doesn't mean he actually thought that's who it was, but he was preparing as if it might be. This is the only time, at least so far, of anything I've done having to do with Bonnie and Clyde, where the police actually prepare adequately for what they have to do. And that impresses me, and actually it makes me really sad that Moore did not do it this way. And at this point, word has gone out that Bonnie is hurt. And so if this is the Barrow Gang, then she is in there and she is incapacitated and we might have a chance at this. That night of the 19th, when Blanche goes to buy dinner, she notices that when she walks in the room, everybody stops talking and stares at her. She buys the food, she goes back to the cabins and she tells Buck what happened. She said, I think they might be onto us. Buck said, all right, we need to tell Clyde about this, but I think we'll probably be okay through tomorrow. They go and they tell Clyde and Clyde basically says the same, uh, basically says the same thing. We'll just sleep tonight and we'll leave in the morning. <laughs> this is exactly what happened to them at Joplin too. When you get a funny feeling that something's going wrong, then you need to just get out of Dodge. But he doesn't seem to have learned his lesson. Well, the posse gathers around 1 a.m. Coffee, Baxter, and about 13 posse members made up of uh, the Sheriff's Department, the Highway Patrol, and they've got this armored car. They pull it up in front of the garage to block it. They've got a spotlight on the door in the left-hand cabin where Blanche and Buck are staying. Coffee and Baxter are in the lead. They are crouching behind their shields and they knock on Buck and Blanche's door. At the knock, Blanche stumbles out of bed and trying to buy time, she says, who is it? He said, it's the sheriff, open up. Next door, Clyde just opens up. Blanche is trying to put her clothes on. Buck stumbles out of bed and he starts shooting out of their window. So WD and Clyde are shooting out of the right hand cabin and Buck is firing out of the left hand cabin. Bullets are not able to punch through the shields, but they definitely have a lot of power. Coffee's son, Clarence, was also there, and he described what it was like for the guys getting hit. He said, quote, the bullets pushed him back like he was hit by a high pressure hose. And so it was knocking Coffee and Baxter back as they were getting hit by these bullets. The only light was coming from the headlights of the of the armored car and the guys mistakenly, all they could see were two shadows in front of them, in front of the door of the cabin. And one of the guys, White Cotton, mistakenly thought that Coffee was one of the gang. And he yells over to Ellis, he says, light them up, there's one of them. And they fire on their own guys. The sheriff got hit in the neck by buckshot, actually. His guy had fired at him with a, a shotgun. He thought he'd been wounded by the gang. And uh, I've read that the guys didn't have the heart to tell him that he got shot by his own men. So they let him believe that he was shot in the line of duty by the bad guys. Just, well, it saved them face too. Hey, sorry we shot you, boss. Inside the cabins, Clyde yells to WD to get in the garage and start the car. Bonnie fishes the keys out of Clyde's pocket, tosses them to WD. He goes in the garage through that interior door. He starts the car. And when he's got it started, Clyde yells to him, raise the garage. But there's so many bullets flying through the walls and into the cabins. WD is too scared to do it. So, Clyde goes in there and he opens it himself and he finds that the armored car is only about 15 feet away from them and they can't get past it. So he opens up on it with his BAR and the bullets go through this armored car. Now this, this is just a regular car that's been reinforced with some extra metal on the doors and the BAR bullets go right through it. He is just Swiss cheesing this car. He hits the driver, his name is High Phil, hits him in the legs, both legs, and if 
he had been able to hang on and kept that car there, they probably could have tightened their net around and, cap and captured them, but he panicked. He was being shot, he was frightened, and surprising Clyde and all of the law enforcement officers, he pulled away, he retreated, and they were able to all pile in the car and zoom away. Unfortunately for Blanche and for Buck, they had to go out the front door in order to get to the car. And when they do this, when they come outside, all of the police open up on them. And Buck is shot in the side of the head. It exits through his forehead. It is a horrible, horrible wound. I don't know how he survived it. And actually, I don't think the gang expected him to survive as long as he did either but he fell between the front door and on the way to the car blanche even though she weighs only 91 pounds now she's lost 20 pounds since they've been on the run she manages to help him up clyde comes over and joins and helps her get buck to the car as they are speeding away to escape they drive right by holt coffee and baxter behind their shields and all of the officers open up on them as they're driving by. This is when they shoot through the back window of, of the car and Blanche has the right side of her face toward that direction. So when that window explodes, all of those shards of glass exploded into her eyes. She immediately yells out, I can't see! But there's nothing Clyde can do except get them out of there and he just floors it gets on Highway 71 and trying to get as much distance between Platte City and them. He spends the next several hours completely lost on these Missouri and Kansas back roads. And I can't even begin to describe you in how bad a shape this group is in at this point. Buck is just bleeding everywhere in the back seat. Bonnie, of course, is burned very severely but she did manage to get herself into the car on her own power i forgot to mention that earlier blanche has glass in both of her eyes she cannot see anything they are a mess they are an absolute mess after everything was said and done and the gang was gone and they got inside the cabins some of the things the gang left behind was a pair of binoculars and a medical kit that had been stolen from a doctor in Oklahoma that was being used to treat Bonnie's burns. The police let Emmett Breen keep this stuff. And as far as I know, his descendants still have it. And here are some pictures of it from Texas Hideout website, which is a great website if you've never been to it. Well, years later, Holt Coffee actually bought the tavern. He became presiding judge of Platte County in 1956. In 1957, the tavern had an accident that knocked down the awning and damaged the gas pumps. And then in 1967, the tavern burned due to a kitchen fire. What was left was demolished to build access roads for the interstate. Three days after this shootout in Platte City, the gang ended up in Dexter, Iowa, where locals became suspicious. They were leaving behind their bloody bandages and evidence of I mean, everybody was wounded, just about. And that's what ended up getting them caught. I mean, throw your trash away or keep it with you. I mean, this gang was just not very smart. They just weren't. It's honestly amazing they were on the loose as long as they were. Buck was hurt so badly, I, they didn't think he would live. I mean, you could see the contents of his head. They were basically waiting for him to die. And they didn't really know what to do for it. They were using peroxide and things like that to try to treat it and bandage it as well as they could. He would talk nonsense every now and then. And he ended up getting shot again in Dexter. And he died several days later. They captured Blanche. She lost sight in that left eye the rest of her life. She did some time in prison and was released and lived a pretty normal life. She died in 1988. And Bonnie and Clyde and WD all got away. They would last another 10 months before Bonnie and Clyde were finally killed. Hey, if you're still watching this, that must mean this is something you like. Please hit the subscribe button. Please turn on notifications. Please like the video. 
because if you're still watching, it means you like it. So let the algorithm know. And please consider supporting me on Patreon. I can be found at patreon.com slash madamorbid. I put extra stuff on there and add free versions of all of my videos, uncensored versions of my videos. This is a channel that gets pretty frequently demonetized, so I depend on help from my fans, so I that would be greatly appreciated. If you can't help financially, though, share, 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 watch the whole thing, like, subscribe, tell everyone you know. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about Bonnie and Clyde. I will see you next week with another crazy story from history. Thanks for watching.